Hi, my name is Tara Moore and I'm Director of Conservation Partnerships for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And we're so excited to welcome you guys here to the first of the Venus Flytrap series. This is a very exciting series for us. This is a species that people love across the entire state, as we can see. We had over 100 people sign up to be on this call today. We're super excited. Um, so thank you all for being here for this first of the series. We will, we will have the second of the series next Wednesday at noon. So you can come back at the same time next Wednesday. And then the third of the series will be the Wednesday after that at noon. So join us all these Wednesdays to learn about Venus flytraps. Um, I have two great speakers and we're looking forward to hearing about Venus flytraps. So I'll turn it over to Julie Moore, who is a Venus flytrap expert and an amazing conservationist. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I'm certainly an enthusiast. I uh, got interested in Venus flytraps when I came to North Carolina to graduate school. And I won't tell you how long ago that was. And I was from the South, but I had never encountered Venus flytraps and it's hard not to become engaged. Through the years, I've worked a lot with uh, different uh, species. I'm an endangered species biologist, now retired. I worked for the Natural Heritage Program here in North Carolina for many years and gotten familiar, particularly with the coastal plain areas. And then most recently, I've worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service with programs that engage private landowners to help them uh, to see what they're willing to do for rare species. And that's what really got me started on this effort. I'm a volunteer in what we're calling the Venus Flytrap Champions Program. And the intent is to engage more private landowners who have flytraps to look after them and manage appropriately. And truth to tell, management is difficult. You got to do a lot for fly traps. You need to burn and you need not to drain your property. So part of our project is to educate the populace of North Carolina about fly traps and then really find those private landowners who have traps and uh, are interested in doing something for them. And truth to tell, if they're not interested, we're going to make them be interested in looking after their Venus fly traps if we possibly can. We have a new website that's just been created. It's called Venus Flytrap Champions. It's quite attractive, has a lot of information. I suggest taking a look at that um, after you finish this listening to us today. Let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. Johnny Randall is with the North Carolina Botanical Garden. He's head of their conservation programs. He's actually doing some research on Venus flytraps and the genetics of flytraps. We're old friends and he has been a long leaf Pine and a Venus flytrap supporter for many years. So he's going to lead us in our presentation today to give us a lot of background on flytraps. And then Laura Heyman, who's been doing research at NC State as a graduate student, also cooperating with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program to find out how many flytraps there really are left out there, which is really the basis of what you need to do to design your conservation efforts. You got to know what you're working with. People have known about flytraps forever, but they haven't known as much as we're learning now. Johnny, are you ready? I am ready. All right. I'm going to go through a very, um, I have a lot of slides, but I'll go through a lot of them quickly. And I want to thank uh, everyone for inviting me, Tara and the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. I'm going to be talking about, um, well, anyway, you'll see what I'm talking about as I get going, but as Many of you know Venus flytrap is incredibly popular outside of crop plants. It's probably the most um, widely recognized plant on earth. So uh, everything from uh, U-Haul trucks to sculptures to, to comic books to, um, to brewing pubs. So where the name comes from um, is uh, from the the goddess Dione um, and uh, and the equivalent Venus. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. Actually, this is being recorded, so and you can read all this yourself. So I will skip ahead so that we don't waste uh, too much time on this. Now, Venus flytrap was much more widely distributed in the past. This uh, figure shows. Uh, the historical range in uh, blue, well, both, of course, colors are, the, um, are the, the, the former range, but it has contracted considerably um, in the past um, 50 years for sure. And that's something that Laura will talk about um, more, and I'll, I'll touch on that a bit. 
But you can find information on Venus flytrap, of course, on the internet. Uh, I mean, just tons and tons of information. Um, it is so popular worldwide. This is something from the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney. Uh, and I visited there some years ago um, and gave a talk. And, you know, they, they were all so interested in our carnivorous plants here in North Carolina in particular, where there's such a diversity of them. Um, all kinds of programs have been done. Um, I was actually on Science Friday a few years ago talking about poaching of Venus flytraps and helped with um, some other things on public TV. Uh, there is an International Carnivorous Plant Society, so everything you ever wanted to know about Venus flytraps is there um, if you want to go to this site. And they're a reputable um, organization that is uh, really dedicated to conservation of carnivorous plants um, globally. Um, this is their Facebook page. And if you live in North Carolina and you happen to wander down to Wilmington, I'll just put in a plug for the Flytrap Brewing Company. Um, they make very good beer, and um, they certainly pick the right place to do it. And in downtown Wilmington, they have a beautiful Venus flytrap sculpture, um, and seeing it at night is particularly um, impressive. So we at the North Carolina Botanical Garden have specialized on, well, in conservation in general um, ever since we started over 50 years ago. And we've always had a great interest in carnivorous plants. Um, and uh, so we have great displays of carnivorous plants and do a lot of research with them as well. Our first holiday parade uh, in the Chapel Hill uh, Carborough area, and we featured Venus flytraps on that. Um, we had a, a, a program that now has become its own entity, um, Wondersphere, um, and this is, um, they take plants to kids in hospitals who are immunosuppressed, and this is a way that kids can actually interact with living things without um, um, coming in contact with them. And behold, the Venus flytrap cocktail. This is our director at the Botanical Garden has um, invented a drink for our upcoming uh, North Carolina uh, Botanical Garden Garden Party. So um, anyway, um, check out um, our garden and, and come to that virtual party. And um, there is right now, um, before the legislature in North Carolina, our Venus flytrap, um, home of the Venus flytrap specialty plate. Uh, so uh, look for that the next time on the license plate. Hopefully that will be approved um, this coming session. So it's waiting to be voted on right now. Um, I have my own great personal interest in flytraps. Uh, my family and I made a, uh, a trip to England a few years ago and a pilgrimage to Charles Darwin's home who studied carnivorous plants um, from all over the world and was particularly fascinated with Venus flytraps. And this is uh, me and Charles Darwin's greenhouse with Venus flytraps. So it was really a, uh, kind of an emotional experience for me to do that. And Darwin would have been delighted with all of the new research that's going on with how the trapping mechanism works and things like that. And it was Darwin who actually um, was the first person to actually document um, how the triggering mechanism works. I'm sure that um, American Indians long ago on the coastal plain of North Carolina figured that out, but of course, they did not write that down, and so much of their knowledge is unfortunately lost to history. Um, I don't know, I don't think Laura is going to talk about this, but she was part of this project looking at the pollinators of Venus flytraps. This was a cooperation um, between our botanical garden and NC State, where Laura's in graduate school, um, and uh, she did part of her master's project on this, um, looking at the pollinators. Um, but at any rate, no one knew what the pollinators were of Venus flytraps before this project, and uh, they were able to determine that pollinators actually don't eat their, I mean, that flytraps don't eat their pollinators, um, and that their prey are crawling insects for the most part, and their pollinators are flying insects, primarily uh, beetles and flies and, um, and bees. And this is uh, some of the work that they were doing in the coastal plain on this. This is a, a great paper if you have an opportunity to look at this and are interested. Um, uh, the really nice graphics that show very little overlap between um, 
the insects that were found in the flowers and in the traps. So it's really nice mechanism um, for a carnivorous plant not to eat its pollinators. Now, some of the perils of Venus flytraps are the fact that they are at high risk. And I'll talk some of, about some of the factors that have created uh, this problem for them. And they have been moved up on the list in terms of their vulnerability to extinction. Um, G2 is a status that um, is of high risk of extinction. The organization NatureServe um, is the one that keeps these data and makes these recommendations to the red list, which is an international list of uh, endangered species, uh, plants, animals, etc. So they are vulnerable on the red list, G2, according to NatureServe. Um, there is actually a proposal in right now by Don Waller at, from the University of Wisconsin to list this as a federally endangered plant. Um, so that's being reviewed right now and um, won't go into that, um, but do know that there are, um, it does fit a lot of the criteria for being federally listed. Um, so why federal listing? Why is it endangered? Why is it vulnerable? Well, this is the main thing, and Julie already mentioned this, that fire is probably um, the key thing that keeps the, the habitat open for Venus flytraps. Um, they do not tolerate shading very well, and they live in habitats. They evolved in habitats where fire was probably on a, uh, a one to three fire year fire return. So um, anytime that overtopping with other herbaceous plants and especially shrubs occurs, um, they really um, drop out quickly. Um, and this is just an example of a place that hasn't been burned in a while. And um, just the, you can see that withering flytrap in the right hand um, side um, down there in the bottom. So another couple of years without fire and these plants could disappear. So this is um, a fire maintained habitat, but they haven't had the opportunity to burn it. Um, anytime that overtopping with other herbaceous plants and especially shrubs occurs, um, they really um, drop out quickly. Um, and this is just an example of a place that hasn't been burned in a while. And um, just the, you can see that withering flytrap in the right hand um, side um, down there in the bottom. So another couple of years without fire and these plants could disappear. So this is um, a fire maintained habitat, but they haven't had the opportunity to burn it. This is a power line cut um, that goes through a state park in North Carolina down in uh, Pender County. And uh, this was, you know, an example of, you know, uh, where the habitat was kept open by the maintenance of this power line by mowing, not by spraying herbicides, um, which is too frequent a, an occurrence right now. Um, but at any rate, this was just a treasure trove of rare plants in this site. Um, a number of federally endangered plants, a lot of state listed plants. Um, and that's my youngest son when he was a little fellow standing there. Um, you can hardly step, uh, take a step without stepping on a Venus flytrap. Well, there was a wildfire in the vicinity and, um, and rather than go through, you know, less, uh, you know, suitable place for a tractor, um, they put the, the plow line right through the middle of this beautiful site. So, um, so this was just a, you know, um, a mistake um, and uh, things like that do happen, but it was very unfortunate. Um, but also draining areas for farmland That's and eagle. for tree farms Ooh, um, is a problem, but, but mostly Let's it's the, um, the conversion uh, or it's mostly the, um, the lack of prescribed fire. And it has to be prescribed fire now too, uh, because uh, there's just too too dangerous to let wildfires burn in the coastal plain, which is an uh, ecosystem meant to burn, especially in these wet pine savannas where Venus flytrap occurs. So this is good habitat. This is down in the, the green swamp area of North Carolina. This is all protected land that's owned by the Nature Conservancy. Um, this is bad habitat. This is where 
um, who knows what's happened. Uh, the, the picture in the upper right hand corner is um, fire suppressed, but these other sites are where there were known flytrap populations, but they have declined because they've dried up and it's uncertain why this is becoming drier, but most likely it's because the water table has been drawn down through agricultural practices um, for irrigation and or just um, overall ditching to drain these areas that are typically wet. Um, and then there are these ugly sites uh, where um, these plant, there's thousands of fly traps in this wet ditch between two unsuitable habitats, a paved surface and a, a, a dry sandy power line cut. And so they occur in this wet ditch. And this is uh, an example of, <clears throat> you know, a population that's just um, just lingering, you know, um, there's no real future for this. And that's why when we collect seeds, we will overemphasize and do what's called a rescue collection of seeds so that we can protect these plants um, in our seed bank and use them for restoration, etc. Now, there's only one really good flytrap population left in South Carolina, unfortunately, um, at the Lewis Ocean Bays Heritage Preserve. And uh, this is a picture where they, uh, I was there um, about three years ago and they just had a fire. In fact, it was still smoldering, um, but Lewis Ocean Bay is right outside of Myrtle Beach. And there is so much development um, uh, pressure around there. It is just remarkable. And I'm not sure quite how this happened, but um, right through Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve, a giant four lane road was put in primarily to give access to Myrtle Beach for tourists. Um, and so now they have um, limited ability to, to burn this site because it's dangerous to put smoke on the road. Um, but it, the main thing is that it's just, uh, it's totally disruptive in this last remaining good uh, flytrap site in South Carolina. Now, another issue is the commercial trade in Venus flytraps and there are good dealers and there's bad dealers. Um, so if you're in the market for Venus flytraps, um, be sure that you're dealing with a reputable group. Um, you can find these, of course, on the internet. So a lot of times it's difficult to determine from where you're getting your flytraps. Um, but um, there should you know, be great if there was um, sort of a, a good housekeeping seal of approval for um, any plant sales, especially rare plants. Um, so these are legitimate vendors. Um, here in North Carolina, we have S&J Greens. Uh, we work with them at our North Carolina Botanical Garden. They do a lot of the propagation of, um, of our pitcher plant um, hybrids that we have um, for sale and also Venus flytraps. And um, I'll talk about this in a minute, but if you'll notice in that upper picture, Notice the uniformity in all of those um, fly traps in those pots. That's a good indication that these were, um, that these are grown, uh, these are nursery propagated plants. And then there are the questionable vendors. I don't know that this is still a questionable vendor, um, but I noticed that Ken Moore was on the call um, or on the program today. And uh, this is a picture of Ken's um, down in Hampstead where there was probably a questionable uh, vendor back in the 1970s that uh, he or um, his friends or people he paid went out and and dug up uh, fly traps for sale. And I think that this um, has been this vendor is still there and I think it's um, has been legitimized. So um, so thanks to Ken for things like that. Um, now in North Carolina, there is a, um, a pretty big penalty <clears throat> for poaching Venus flytraps in, in most of the counties where it occurs. It's a felony. Um, and every trap that you poach um, is an additional felony. So uh, the last people who were um, caught, they had over a million dollar bail um, because of all the flytraps that they, um, they had poached. Um, and we at the garden receive poached um, fly traps and pitcher plants, um, uh, not as often as we were receiving them, but what we would do is, um, uh, that's of course, if the people were caught, um, and then we would grow them up, um, get a root system on them, and then repatriate them in to appropriate locations. 
Um, uh, so how might you spot a poached Venus flytrap? Well, here's one way. Um, again, look for that uniformity in growth, um, uh, even though the ones on the left are not as uniform as uh, they might be, but there are no, um, there are no weed seeds um, or no native, other native plants that you would find growing with Venus flytraps in those pots. Whereas the pot on the right, um, it has all these sedges and hypericums and other things that are typical are typical associates of, associates of Venus flytraps in the wild. So um, that would be a real red flag is to see a plant like that on the right. Um, this is Leslie Stark, who will talk with you next week about um, their work on the, at the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. And <clears throat> um, I'm not sure exactly what she'll be talking about, but this is just a picture of Leslie repatriating some plants. A number of years ago, uh, the Nature Conservancy contracted uh, with an intern to actually find out um, what was going on with respect to poaching. And um, her conclusion was that it was the, um, the plant industry that was hiring people to, um, to collect these plants from the wild. Um, so a number of people have looked at, um, you know, how to uh, reduce the amount of poaching, and I'll talk about it in a second. And at one time, there was um, the thought that Venus flytraps are being collected to extract a drug called carnivora that was supposed to be um, active against um, cancers. And uh, there's no real proof at all that this works. But, you know, when you have cancer, um, you know, um, you will try lots of things that might work. So this was an unfortunate thing, but I think that the, they are not getting their fly traps from North Carolina. Um, there was a, a really great article, and I heard this um, this attorney talk um, a few months ago. She's actually in California, um, but these were some of the re uh, ways that she saw to remedy what she calls the poverty caused poverty poaching and. Oftentimes, and certainly it is, that uh, people who are stressed for resources are the ones that are coerced to go out and collect these plants, um, and then they're the ones that get caught. But it's really the, um, you know, the middleman, the nursery, uh, if it's the nursery industry, um, that should be reprimanded. So I'm going to switch gears right now and talk a little bit about some of our research. Um, we have uh, a project funded through the International Carnivorous Plant Society to look at the genetic architecture of Venus flytraps. And, um, and the, so when I say genetic architecture, essentially um, we're looking at the diversity of Venus flytraps uh, within and between populations and to learn if there are any, um, you know, any uh, particular populations that have unique genotypes that might um, that might should be protected and or properly managed if they're not currently. Um, and uh, anyway, to learn a lot more about um, Venus flytrap genetics. So we're um, about at the end of that research project and um, I'll show you some preliminary data in a minute. But also um, we were collecting seeds for our seed bank. Um, as a stopgap against extinction in the wild. So uh, we, um, I, and I'll go more into that in just a second. Here are some of the primary research questions. Um, I won't go through all of these. Um, the main thing is uh, that we were uh, doing this to determine not only the, the genetic difference within and between populations, but also to uh, to see how Venus flytraps migrated over time uh, within the coastal plain, because at one time uh, the oceans inundated much of the coastal plain where their habitat is, like it's getting ready to do again. Um, and uh, there is an idea that the sand hills, especially in the Fort Bragg area where there are Venus flytraps, that that might have been the refugium or uh, where Venus flytraps um, um, occurred or, you know, uh, found refuge when the coastal plain was inundated um, by the oceans. Um, but we're going to be able to determine those migration patterns um, out from there if that was indeed the case. Uh, so in our project, um, we have um, good data on where Venus flytrap populations occur. Uh, we work closely with the Natural Heritage Program 
and with the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. And so we determine uh, the best places to collect uh, seeds and tissue um, for our particular project. And we do follow very strict um, guidelines for collecting seeds. We don't collect any more than 10% of the population or 10% of the seeds in any population in any one of 10 years, um, except in special occasions like where my colleague is collecting down here next to this, um, this roadside, we would collect um, an extra amount in a situation like this. And as you can see um, in that, or do notice that uh, my hand in the upper right, right hand picture, the tiny Venus flytrap seeds, they're about the size of a poppy seed. So, um, and so we would take maybe, you know, uh, just a few seeds from any one plant. And it's important to capture the genetic diversity across a population too. So we would sample from about 200 different plants, a few seeds from each plant to, uh, to put in our seed bank. So these seeds that we have in our seed bank would be used for a legitimate reintroduction where that's appropriate. Um, they can be used for research. And also, as I mentioned, this is a place where seeds can live long term in a seed bank um, uh, as a stopgap against extinction of these plants in the wild. Um, and so over the over a two year period, uh, we collected over 94,000 seeds uh, from 64 different sites and we um, are continuing to collect these seeds. Uh, we collected more last year and I'll collect more this year. Uh, we want to collect from as many populations as possible. Um, but this shows Mike Coons and one of our interns um, processing these. So uh, we collect each seed collection from an individual population is a separate accession. Okay, so um, each envelope that you see comes from a the seeds come from a different plant. So um, in order to um, to keep track of all the different mothers. So if we were to do a reintroduction, we would want to take a few seeds out of each of those envelopes in order to ensure that uh, the plants have as much genetic diversity as possible um, in an introduction or an augmentation where you would add individuals to a population to get it up to uh, what's called a viable population size. And this is just an example, again, of our uh, record keeping. So we do keep track, very careful records of all our accessions, the number, uh, where they're located. Um, this is not, you know, um, this is not confidential information right here. We would not share that. But another thing that we do is um, we do germination tests on all our collections to make sure that the seeds that we're collecting are indeed viable. And then we desiccate the seeds um, and then freeze dry them. Um, uh, did I say freeze dry them? Uh, shrink wrap them in these foil envelopes and then put them in our freezer. And this reminded me of um, that picture of Han Solo being um, uh, uh, trapped in carbonite. Um, so uh, that's the first thing I thought of when I see these seed packets that have been vacuum sealed. But when we do the tissue collection for the, um, the DNA study, uh, that has to be captured in dry ice. Uh, so um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, really problematic hauling a cooler around over, uh, you know, if you're walking a mile with a cooler full of dry ice, and you collect tissue from the plants, um, just a couple of leaves per plant. We would never take more than a couple of leaves. Um, and then put them on dry ice and keep them frozen until we get back to uh, the, the genome center at Carolina. So these are some of the preliminary data on our project. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, so these are uh, uh, all the tissue collections that we have made uh, throughout the Venus flytrap range. Um, and it shows four distinct clusters of uh, genetic uh, families, you might call them. And uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but up here at the, the, at the, the upper left uh, red circle is Fort Bragg. Um, that makes a distinct collection. Um, then the other collections represent um, a place called the Cape Fear Arch in the lower left-hand uh, portion. 
and the Oslo Bide in the upper right-hand portion, and then um, there's an anomalous area in between. But these are um, uh, so at least we've got the first cut that there is real um, genetic diversity based on distribution. So stay tuned for the results of these numerous studies and conservation activities. Be sure and look at the new website that Julie uh, Moore has put together um, or is helping to put together. Um, that's so, supposed to be the repository of all things Venus flytrap in terms of research and uh, conservation. And a lot of people helped with this project. Um, it wasn't just me and the conservation staff. It was people from all different organizations, from Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nature Conservancy, um, the um, Department of Defense, uh, Wildlife Resources Commission, etc. So thanks to all these people who helped with this, this project. So thank you very much. Perfect, and then we'll turn it over to Laura. To well, well, let me you. just say something in between, if I may. Uh, that you. list of, the list of people that uh, Johnny just showed us shows the variety of organizations and agencies that are interested in fly traps. And really what we're trying to do with our longleaf, um, I keep saying longleaf because I work on that so much, Venus flytrap champions is to engage as many partners as we can from um, land trust, the Nature Conservancy, Department of Defense, uh, just our state program, state forestry and the plant conservation program. This is an effort not led by one group, but it's really a consortium that's trying to address our issue here in North Carolina and South Carolina, of making sure that fly traps stay on the landscape. Johnny, that was a wonderful uh, overview of what's going on and what has gone on. Thank you. Are we ready for Laura now? We are ready. If you just want to click the X on your screen, it looks like we have Johnny's screen still up. So you can just click that little X next to the leave button. Awesome. Laura is a graduate student at uh, North Carolina State University, and she's actually studying both uh, plants and insects. And you can really understand why she needs to know both with the work she's doing. She also cooperates with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program and has recently uh, completed or coordinated, really, I think it was, wasn't it, Laura, an inventory of where these plants still exist. So I'll let you tell us about that, if you would, please. Great. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Let me know if you can't. I have terrible Wi-Fi here, so there might be a 10 to 20 second delay on these slides. Um, but that's OK, because I'll be doing a lot of talking. So I'm Laura Heyman. As mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at NC State, um, and I'm a temporary employee with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. Um, I just want to mention really briefly up top that um, as Johnny mentioned, a lot of sort of the indigenous knowledge of this plant has been sort of lost. And the coast of what is now known as North and South Carolina is the ancestral home of multiple indigenous groups, including but not limited to the Chikorin, Koheri, Cori, Lumbee, Tuscarora, and Wakamasuan peoples. So this is where this survey took place. Um, again, there might be a delay, so apologies if you're still seeing my previous slide, but I just want to give a little context for the survey. Um, as Johnny mentioned, in 2016, Don Waller at um, University of Wisconsin-Madison um, uh, submitted a petition to have Venus flytrap potentially listed as an endangered species. Um, and in 2018, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service awarded a grant to Natural Heritage Program to actually figure out how many Venus flytraps are out there in the wild, which is an important uh, aspect of determining whether a species is endangered. Um, and then in May and August of 2019, um, we started the survey and it was a survey focusing on public managed areas and private land conservancies where flytraps occur. And then the following year, um, Daniel Hannon, who was an employee with the Natural Heritage Program, now is at the NC Wildlife Resource Commission, led the survey focusing largely on private landowners, um, which was very interesting. And it was interesting to hear about his experiences speaking to landowners and their enthusiasm for this plant. Um, 
So again, the objective of this survey was to count and map as many extant and historic populations as possible, um, at the same time noting threats and um, recording the ongoing management that takes place at all these sites. So again, phase one in 2019 was those managed areas and phase two focused on um, private lands, which, which may or may not be specially managed for Venus flytrap conservation. Um, we did two primary methods to count Venus flytraps. In our first method, which we called our absolute counts, we would have two um, surveyors, one that would lead the direction of the survey, and the second that would look about two and a half meters on either side of the surveyor in some sort of um, vague transect that we tracked using GPS um, and counted all individuals flytrap individuals seen on either side, and we would sort of go back and forth across the entire population. And then in a couple mega populations where we had limited time, we would do that for a subset of the total population and extrapolate out our total area. Um, in addition to the core survey team of Natural Heritage Program um, scientists and surveyors, um, this was a collaborative effort, so there were additional survey groups with the Nature Conservancy, um, with the US Army Corps of Engineers and additional contractors. So multiple groups who were collecting um, population data for flytrap in the past couple of years. At the same time, and this is something that's a little bit less known, um, there is a moth that specializes almost exclusively on eating Venus flytrap which might sound like a bad thing <laughs> if you're concerned with the flytrap, but really because flytrap is rare, the moth is uh, by extension extremely rare. Um, so uh, while we were doing the survey for flytrap, we were also keeping our eyes peeled for distinctive damage associated with this moth. Um, and this is an ongoing aspect of this survey. So following the survey work, hopefully, it's not too distracting that there's a lawnmower going on. Um, the uh, a data team at Natural Heritage Program, including Suzanne Mason and others, uh, entered the data and assigned population ranks to show um, which of these are the best populations. Um, so an A-ranked population has over 2,000 individuals. Apologies for the noise. So. Uh, as a result, um, our, pop our team visited 25 populations um, with five additional populations visited by other survey teams and for a total of 30 out of 67 extant populations visited. Um, and this might sound like only a fraction of the populations, but our fo survey focus was on these massive mega populations. Um, and so we ended up um, hitting most of those and actually getting a really good idea of how many uh, fly traps there are total, if not a good idea of those other populations. So as a result, we counted over 870,000 individuals in the wild. Um, that's about uh, some 500,000 from the absolute count method and over 100,000 from the transect method with an additional 200,000 um, from other survey groups. I'm trying to move away from the noise here. Um, prior to the survey, NatureServe estimated a total population size of 73,000 to 158,000 individuals, um, which was taken from sort of the most conservative possible estimates of these populations. Um, and sometimes in, in media, sometimes you'll see 30,000 cited as the total population size. So we do know that uh, it's actually way larger than that with over 870,000, um, which by one hand sounds like great news. Um, on the other hand, those populations are really, really concentrated in a small number of areas. So there are only a few A-ranked populations and some 30% of the global population of Venus flytrap is concentrated at one particular managed area in Brunswick County, um, with additional mega populations in Pender and Onslow counties. Um, so although there are many more Venus flytraps than we uh, originally anticipated, those are really concentrated in a really small number of populations. 
Um, and Johnny showed a similar map in his in, in his presentation, but all the counties that you see that are green, whether light, darker, or middling green, are counties where um, we uh, where Venus flytrap is extant, while those yellow, orange, and red populations are where they're um, failed to find or are considered historic or um, are extirpated. Um, so there are only 11 counties where Venus flytrap still occurs and one South Carolina county. I just wanted to let so, you know that it seems like your slides are a bit lagging, probably the issue I think with the Wi-Fi. So um, just if you like reference something on the slide, we're probably not not fully seeing it, Laura. So just to give you a heads up on that. OK, apologies Thanks. for that. No, so, that's not your fault. <laughs> so anything I say, you'll you'll get a sort of 20 second delay on on actually <laughs> seeing what I'm talking about. Um, please feel free to ask questions if you need me to clar clarify anything um, at the end. And maybe I'll just describe what I'm looking at right now. Um, we also summarized um, threats that we observed at different populations. So again, although Venus flytraps were more numerous than we expected, we still saw the effects of fire suppression, of ongoing development, of hydrological changes from ditching, um, and also um, some, some signs of illegal collection. So on the left here is Surveyor Summer Louder. She's in a population that previously had um, a thousand individuals and it looks like a truck went through here and completely uprooted it and there were only 116 individuals here in 2019. Um, so that graph on the which you may or may not be able to see <laughs> on the right is just how we summarized um, which of these certain threats we we saw so we quantified um, at, at some sort of qualitative level um, which of these threats that we saw. Um, and in 2019, which is some good news because this, this moth has not been seen that many times uh, ever, um, we did uh, positively identify two of the cutworm larvae at one particular site, at a new site for the species. Um, so when you're able to see the slide on the right on my hand, um, and on the left is the sort of distinctive feeding damage, so when you're able to see that slide, Apologies again for the noise. Um, some of the limitations of the survey was we were visually biased to flowering individuals and also there was a drought going on. So overall, um, we would expect actually that our total count was somewhat of an underestimate um, for the survey. Um, and just a little update on some ongoing uh, work. Uh, I'm currently uh, at the coast right now in an Airbnb with bad Wi-Fi and next next to uh, a workshop um, because I am working on a, a survey for the cutworm moth. It's uh, exclusively for the cutworm moth that eats flytrap, um, searching for the adults. So every night we're going out and we're putting out light traps um, to trap the adult moths in Venus flytrap habitat identifying them and letting them go. So far in our in our two nights of sampling, we've seen about 200 moths, uh, none of them the cutworm moth so far, but we're very hopeful. And acknowledgements, a lot of these acknowledgements when you're able to see them uh, overlap with Johnny's acknowledgements, but tons of people, as Julie mentioned, um, it's, a, it's a hugely collaborative effort. So um, the survey was led by me and also Daniel Hannon with multiple uh, uh, surveyors, Ryan Martin, Summer, John Libby, Eric, um, our supervisors, and many, many, many land managers and people who helped us in the field, um, in addition to our, our funding from Fish and Wildlife. Um, so with that, I'll end my presentation. Apologies for the noise and the lag. And yeah. Thank you, Laura. That was I know you dashed in from the field this morning and uh, to make this presentation and I, you'll probably dash out momentarily, but I suspect there'll be plenty of questions for both you and Johnny. So if you can stick with us a little longer to answer some of those questions, and I'm particularly glad that you mentioned about the moth. I think that's fascinating uh, the whole association of species here. Tara, would you handle the, the questions? Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you so much. I learned so much today. So thank you both for speaking with all of your great skills.
skills and knowledge. Um, so I see a question, a hand raised from Mike Barnard. If you'd like to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. When Johnny was mentioning poaching, um, they, I don't, he's, I'm pretty sure he's aware of it. In 2013, somebody massively poached the Stanley Redder Carnivorous Plant Garden in Wilmington over near Independence Mall. And that uh, led some, some incentive to the governor of North Carolina. And in December 2014, flytrap poaching was elevated from a misdemeanor offense to a class H felony. Um, they have caught several massive poachers, not not the 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 poor people looking for trying to scrape together some rent money, but the next person up in the chain who had hundreds or thousands of fly traps in their vehicle at the time they were caught. And I just wanted to say that the judge made an example out of out of several of them. And I was quite pleased to see that because as far as I'm concerned, there is absolutely no excuse for digging up the wild plants. There are plenty of them available in cultivation if somebody wants to buy one. I'm not sure if you had any comments on that, Johnny, Laura, Julie. Yeah, I mentioned that it was a felony, but I, I've, it's, it's, I've not been able to find out <clears throat> much information about who was caught and what their punishment was. So I'm glad to learn that. Yeah. Johnny, <laughs> if, if you want to provide me with an email address, I can send you some of the links that I found. Um, I, I have a friend of mine in, in Nashville, North Carolina, who sells a lot of uh, tissue cultured fly traps from AG3 out of Florida. And um, he um, he uh, was made, made particular mention about the fact that, that about he screens anything, anything coming in, because he absolutely will not touch any plant that looks like it was wild collected whatsoever. Well, why don't you, um, my email is simple. Uh, it's jrandall at unc.edu. You can find me on the Botanical Garden website too. Thanks. All right. Thank you Great. very much. Great, thank you guys. So if anyone, if you're having trouble putting a question in the chat, um, you can raise your hand and it's the little raise hand symbol at the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, it looks like this um, and I do see a few questions coming in. So we'll start with Tammy Baker. You can unmute yourself. Hello, um, I just wanted to comment. I live in Horry County, South Carolina. And I just wanted to comment on the big road. I don't know how they got, it's called International Drive. I don't know how they got that in there. They're telling us that it only took like 85 feet of the Lewis Ocean Bay National uh, Heritage Preserve. Um, but they do close that four lane and continue to do controlled burns for the, um, the critters that live there, the plants and the animals and the, you know, the different things that need that done. But uh, that being said, Horry County is not good on conservation. We wish we could do more. Yep, that was unfortunate. Yeah, it was very unfortunate. I don't know how much of that got lost. Do you? I mean, I would really love to know. I've talked with the biologists there, and I think there was a significant amount of um, habitat loss. But also, it it really disrupted the hydrology and and the connection across that giant interstate-like highway. Right, because the other side of that interstate-type highway um, is owned by Horry County, and that is going to be turned over to the Department of Natural Resources and um, taken care of by them as well. But with that four lane running through it, it is a, a big disruption. Y'all go outside. A big disruption um, to the habitat. But I just wanted to let you know that we do continue to burn, but we're, I'm sorry about that. And I really hated that that road went in. But after Florence, that was our only way to get anywhere. We would have been an island. But I'm still just not that happy with it. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Tammy. Um, and we'll turn it to, to Debbie Crane. I think you are unmuted. You can go ahead. Sure. This is for Laura. Laura, you're, you're <clears throat> at least on my computer, I couldn't see when you were talking about the three populations that were really in good shape. 
one in Brunswick and I forgot the other two. What what ownership are they in right now? That top one is the Nature Conservancy. The second top second to the top one is uh, Wildlife Resource Commission, and then Department of Defense is is also up there. Cool. Thanks. If I may add something, uh, Debbie Crane is with um, the North Carolina chapter of the, the Nature Conservancy, and she has designed a brochure for us that we've prepared for landowners. And um, that will be hopefully published soon, thanks to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So that'll be coming out uh, for private landowners to see if we can't encourage more people uh, to engage uh, with flytrap and we hope to help them not only recognize them for their efforts, but also help them get the technological help they need for burning. And as you also heard so much about drainage and how important maintaining the drainage is. So that's another aspect of the whole thing. Various people are contributing in different ways, just like this series of webinars and what the Nature Conservancy is doing. And uh, we also have several contributors to other aspects of this, a video we're going to be making about how to manage fly traps. If you're with an organization or even as individuals and want to help with this project, please come up with a good idea and I'll be glad to talk to you about it and everybody will so that we can get more people engaged uh, with this effort because I'm an old lady and I really think that in my lifetime I want to make sure that fly traps stay here in several places. The losses are phenomenal though we just heard Laura in certain places there are lots of individuals but it's the population and the spread into South Carolina and as far north as we can go. And it may be there are opportunities for reintroductions in the future. If any of you all know landowners who have fly traps or good habitat, please uh, look at our website and we'll get a brochure to them and see who we can get to go visit them because we really need to engage the private sector as well as public lands. I'm going to add one thing. Uh, one of the suggestions was that the public land managers are extremely important in what happens to fly traps. And we also will recognize uh, the private uh, landowners, but also recognize those good managers on public land, whether it's the Croatan or on um, a piece of state land, or uh, let's say even at um, Camp Lejeune. Whoever's doing a good job managing, we want to continue them to do that kind of work. Do you have another question or two in the, in the loop, Tara? Yes, we have a Wilson Laney question, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Wilson. Thanks. Tara, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, the, I noticed, and this is for any of you who wants to answer, Laura, Julie, or Johnny, I noticed in, in the photos of the fly traps mm -hmm. that the, uh, the leaves, the traps, were different colors. Uh, some of them were very, very pale, and others were very, very bright red. Is that just a function of the maturity of the plant? Or is there some genetic component that uh, causes different uh, plants to have different colored leaves? Well, I, there are certainly genetics involved. Um, and also, there probably are some environmental factors involved. But there's a student at Duke who is uh, a graduate student who's studying a lot of those issues. Um, I don't know if Laura or Julie, you can add anything to that? I, I can if you can hear me over the machinery. Um, <laughs> um, there was a study in 2015 that seemed to suggest that uh, fly traps that are starred for nutrients, for nitrogen specifically, are, are a little redder. And there are some people that purport that light availability has some effect on that red, which comes from anthocyanins. And it's probably genetics as well. So it's probably a mixture of different things. The story is a little unclear. I do believe we'll get an information uh, from the research that's being done pretty soon at Duke. And we're going to post uh, research projects that are going on and haven't been completed yet. So you all will know what sort of uh, questions are being addressed for fly traps. It's amazing that a plant that's known so well, we really know so little about different aspects of its uh, life history. Thanks, that was a great question. And we have a question from uh, Tammy Baker, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am, I just wanted to say, was the, um, the redder leaves, were those the more healthy ones? 
from that 2015 study, the redder leaves were ones that were starved for nitrogen, and the, re the authors suggested that maybe it had an attractant uh, function, or maybe it was something purely physiological. It's, it's, it's unclear. I see very healthy uh, plants that are entirely green, um, so it's, it's not a clear story again. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Tammy. Um, if anyone has any other pressing questions, we have a rock star group of people on this call to be able to answer them. So this is your time if you have a Venus flytrap question. And if you can't find the raise hand um, button, you can also just unmute yourself now and ask a question about anything related to Venus flytraps. And I'm sure that these three would be happy to take a shot at it. If you, oh, we have a question from Alvin. Un <clears throat> unmuted. Okay. Your uh, question. Yep. Uh, surveyors are getting out in Venus flytrap habitat. That happens to be in uh, some areas good habitat potential for the mimic glass lizard, which is a species of concern, uh, very limited distribution uh, inland from the, along the coastal counties. I'm just curious if any of these uh, folks are seeing any glass lizards while they're doing their survey work. I have not, Alvin. I'm always looking out for things crawling under my feet. Um, I've seen um, uh, cane brake rattlesnakes, but I haven't seen any glass lizards. <laughs> well, they're a bit more cryptic. <laughs> well, Alvin, you need to send us a picture so we can all be on the lookout for those. Okay, I can do that, Julie. Something that I failed to mention when we started this conversation today is that Venus flytraps are really part of the greater longleaf pine ecosystem and the savannas particularly and seepages at Fort Bragg and we have so many unusual species associated with longleaf pine and that uh, all fits together with the whole concept of burning and draining so the, these plants are a subset the flytraps are one of the most unique thing in the longleaf ecosystem but we have so many species associated with longleaf from glass lizards to pine snakes to red cockaded woodpeckers where just all kinds of things grow with venus flytraps they're it's just they're the icing on the cake sort of i guess is how i describe them for the longleaf ecosystem well let me add something to that julie um that the some of the highest plant species diversity on earth is within those that ecosystem so over 50 plant species have been found in a meter square area in those wet pine savannas. They're pretty amazing. Has anybody okay. else raised yes. their hand? We just have two more questions. Yes, um, we have a Wilson Laney question, if you'd like to unmute yourself again. Yeah, it's, it's more of a comment, <clears throat> but it sort of tags on to Alvin's comment, and that is, that the range of the Venus flytrap just happens to nicely overlap the range of the Carolina pygmy rattlesnake uh, and the uh, coral snake as well. And coral snakes are particularly uncommon. So if any of you in the course of your Venus flytrap survey work uh, run across either coral snakes or pygmy rattlesnakes, I'm sure the museum and the Natural Heritage Program both would love to, to have those uh, distribution records. That would involve some uh, log rolling and such, wouldn't it? Not necessarily, Johnny. Yeah, probably. I'll defer to Alvin on that question. But, but for coral snakes, probably yes. But the pygmies, not so much. The pygmies right. are, are fairly commonly found uh, a lot of times under the overhanging leaves of uh, clumps of wire grass. Um, and I have seen them, you know, out and about in the, in the open, not very often, but uh, they're, they're much more easily run across than the coral snakes are. Alvin, would you concur with that? Uh, yes, I would. North Carolina uh, Wildlife Coral Federation. snake activity. Uh, there's some reports of uh, morning it being a good time for a coral snake on surface activity. Uh, but uh, it's, the coral snake is a hard one to spot in North Carolina. For sure. Okay, we have one more question. 
Uh, Rebecca Gibson, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. I have a very naive question. I am new to the area of Wilmington and very new to the to the idea of the Venus flytrap. All I want to do is to see some of them without harming the environment. How can I do that and not mess up the plants themselves or their habitat? I just want to be as invisible and as everything is possible, I do want to have them sort of in my view. Well, you certainly live in the right place. One of the <laughs> that was mentioned was the Stanley Reader Garden that's right there in Wilmington. And when the fellow mentioned about the poaching there, well, the people were poaching there because there were enough fly traps right there to be taken. That's in captivity. And there's also Carolina Beach State Park where you can see fly trap habitat. Okay. And if you get more adventurous, the Nature Conservancy has a wonderful preserve called the Green Swamp. If you look at their website, you can find out about field trips to that area. Uh, I did, the other two you can see by yourself uh, with no problem, but I don't think since you're new to the area, we should send you to the Green Swamp without a guide. <laughs> well, I, I, this is Debbie from the Nature Conservancy. Actually, you, you can find them pretty easily there, especially when they're in bloom. Uh, there's a great place to see them and it'll be late May, early June, and there's a boardwalk. There's a trail that takes you right there from the trailhead. You just look for little white flowers, stick it up in the air, and you should be able to see them. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We we have a few more hands coming in, but I know we're we're right at the hour, a little bit over actually. So if you guys do have questions, we would be happy to get those questions over to our speakers. I think they'd be happy to answer a question through through email, um, all three of our lovely speakers today. Um, so thank you so much for being here on this call and we are looking forward to next week. So join us back here next Wednesday for the second of the Venus Flytrap series. And I'll turn it over to Julie in case she has any last comments. Well Yes, thank you for reminding us about the next one. We'll have hear from one private landowner who has fly traps and how he manages his property, Andy Wood. And we'll also talk to, uh, hear from, I should say, uh, Leslie Stark, who manages the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. And they have a preserve there in the Boiling Springs area and what they're doing for management. So next week we'll be concentrating on management in the third week, we'll be talking uh, further about conservation efforts and how all this fits together. So if you can join us for all of these, please do and share with anybody you know what's going on with fly traps. And should you know landowners who have good habitat, we really need to be in touch with them because we do intend to work with as many people as we can to encourage uh, conservation of the species on private land as well as public land. There's a role for the private landowner and I think we need to just help them a little bit on that. Thank you all for being on this call. This is a huge call that we've had today and uh, for our speakers particularly. And I always learn something from both Laura and Johnny. So we're constant learners. Look at our website. We'll be putting on more information all the time. That's venusflytrapchampions.org. So stay tuned. Okay, bye everyone. Thanks for joining. And thank you for sponsoring this. Of course. Yeah. Bye Tara. Bye everyone. Thank bye, you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.